again, let's go ahead and talk about Wednesday of our packet. On Wednesday, we have to finish the chapter review for math and do our extra math, just like always. Don't forget to be working on flashcards if you're still struggling with some multiplication or division facts, or even addition and subtraction flashcards are always a good idea if you need a refresher. If you need help with the chapter review or anything else, please be sure and email or text me and let me know. Our reader's notebook, we have some pages to do in that. Our first one is page 163. It is a word sort. We have done word sorts every week of third grade. This one looks a little different than normal, but instead of having them in boxes with lines in them, they gave us a different kind of box. We're talking about the vowels in the first syllable. Remember, syllables are those things we always count when we talk about syllables. So per son would have two syllables, but we're talking about the first syllable in all of those. So on number one, per son, that would be that E in the first syllable. So we would write that one in the E box. You're supposed to add the challenge words to your word sort as well. No review words this week, just basic words and challenge words. Page 164 is a proofreading for spelling. We, again, have done this every single week of third grade, so we know how to do this. Make sure that you try to write those words in cursive. And page 165, we did that yesterday, so we don't have to do that one today. Page 166, I'd like for you to look at page 166 if you have that handy. This is about abbreviations for places. An abbreviation is a shortened form of a word. Now, it tells us that second bullet point says that places with names that can be abbreviated include roads, streets, lanes, avenues, and boulevards. And then it gives you some examples. Harrison R.D. with a period there, that means road. You can go ahead and write that down if you need to, and that will help you remember that R.D. period means road. S.T. period on Maple Street, that means street. The next one is Elmira Lane, L.N. period, that's lane. Plainville Avenue, A.V.E. period, that would be avenue. And then the last one is broad BLVD period, and that means boulevard. That's kind of a long word. So that will help you because on numbers 1 through 10, all of those are in that little box with that second bullet point. So that will help you remember what those are. Remember, RD is road, ST is street, LN is lane, AVE is Avenue, and BLVD is Boulevard. Now, all of those are still proper nouns, and they all start with a capital letter, and they all have a period at the end of the abbreviation. So make sure that you remember that when you're doing this paper. It says to write each place name correctly, use capital letters and abbreviations and periods there. So go ahead and do that. Yes, you need to write them all down. And I would like for you to write in cursive so that you can practice that. So that's one of our pages that we need to do in the reader's notebook. Reread your story again. See if you can um, have someone read that with you. Maybe read it to someone. That's always a good idea. In our producers and consumers book, we're talking about pages six and seven. I'm not going to read this whole thing to you, but we're talking about supply and demand, and we've talked about this before. There are lots of different businesses out there, and sometimes the businesses come and go, as we said yesterday. This is a story, or a tale, of two lemonade stands. Lisa opens up a lemonade stand, and then Lenny opens one right across the street, and you'll have to read this to find out what happens to them. But supply and demand is very simple. If there is a high supply and a great demand, that means lots of people want to buy what they have, it's a low price. If there's a high supply, they have a lot of things. And low demand, no one is interested in buying their things, that's a very low price. If there aren't very many things, and everyone's wanting them, that makes it a very high price. 
and then the low supply, and not very many people are wanting it, that equals a high price. It's kind of hard to understand sometimes, but if you have a lot of something and you're having a hard time selling it because no one's wanting it, that's when you mark it down and try to get rid of it. But if you have something and everyone's wanting it, you can make some money on that. So read the story about the lemonade stands. Talk to someone in your family about that. Think about some different ways. We talked about the word entrepreneur yesterday, and that's what Lisa is doing here. She's trying to start her own business. So think about some different businesses. Tell someone in your family or email me and let me know if you were going to start a business, what kind of business would you like to start? You might be surprised at some of the interesting ideas that you come up with. I'm going to read a little bit of Virginia. Remember, you should be reading 20 minutes of a chapter book two. And I used a bookmark this time so I won't forget where I was. November 7th, 1864. It was drizzly again today. Jane Ellen and I are quite nervous about the election tomorrow. After my Latin lesson, we were restless for a walk, so we carried umbrellas down Pennsylvania Avenue. We passed boarding houses, grocery shops, saloons, and restaurants. We passed peddlers selling fish and newsboys selling war news. We passed geese and hogs and cows and sheep. We were almost to the president's mansion when it began thundering and lightning. We turned back and slogged home through a sea of mud. Ambulance wagons plowed by us. They sloshed the mud all over our skirts. By the time we were home, our boots and clothes were nearly ruined. I do not complain, though. The soldiers in the wagons were far more forlorn than we. Later, sick and wounded soldiers lie in hospitals all around the city, Jed says. He told us that President Lincoln sometimes visits them. The president goes from man to man, touching each and saying, God bless you. The president has no concern for his personal safety, Jed says. November 8, 1864, before dawn. It pours rain outside. I am wide awake. The election is today. I am trembling with nerves. President Lincoln is my greatest hero. Ever since I saw him speak in Gettysburg, I felt he has been touched by the hand of God. I worry, though, that the muddy streets might keep his supporters away. He has many enemies, Jed says, who wish he would not be reelected. Afternoon. Paul said crowds of men were making their way through the foggy, wet streets. Many have rolled up their trousers to wade through the mud. They all seem determined to vote. At dinner, Jed said that Lincoln supporters are gathering outside the telegraph office to wait for the voting, the voting count. I begged Paul to take me there, and he has said yes. He and Jed and I will leave soon so we can hear the news with the crowd. Evening. We have won. President Lincoln has been re-elected. Hoorah. Our vote has not been completely counted. But outside the telegraph office, word came that the president has most certainly won. The cheering crowd marched through the streets of Mr. Wa Mr. Lincoln's Washington. We marched straight to the president's house. Standing on his lawn, we sang the battle cry of freedom. Soon, President Lincoln and his wife appeared at a window. Through the mist, he seemed a dream figure, tall, dignified, dressed in a black suit. He made a short speech, giving thanks to the Almighty. Paul, Jed, and I nearly danced home through the foggy, rain-swept streets. Right now, as it starts to glow light, I, can, I still cannot sleep. Isn't it amazing? We live only a short distance from the President of the United States. The city is dirty and muddy. Our rooms are small and shabby. Paul has not found a job yet. Jed needs a raise. Jade Ellen is sick. But at this moment, there is nowhere on earth I would rather be. November 10th, 1864. Paul looked for work today at Ford's New Theater and Grover's National Theater. But the managers of both said they do not need a violin player now. November 12, 1864. Today, Paul went to the Washington Theater and the Oxford Hall of Music looking for a job, but neither of them needs a violin player either. Monday, he will go to Seton Hall where they have fancy balls. I can tell Paul is beginning to get very worried. I know he fears we will not have enough money to stay here in Washington City. November 14, 1864. Paul came home sad again. He did not get a job at Seton Hall. 
November 15, 1864. Paul has given up hope of finding work as a violin player. We read in the paper today that they need a watchman at the Navy Yard. He will go there tomorrow. November 16, 1864. Jed came home with big news about the war tonight. General Sherman has led 60,000 men against Atlanta. They burned the city and left it in ruins. Even though she is no longer close to the war, the war is still going on and it's still a huge part of this story. November 17, 1864, Paul did not get a job at the Navy Yard. Unless he gets a job, we will end up in the poorhouse, he said tonight. Jed told Paul not to worry. He said he will quit his work at the newspaper. He said he saw an ad for a woodcutter today. And he can make more money chopping wood than setting type, he told Paul. Paul got furious. He said Jed could not leave the newspaper. He must stay there until he uses his talents to write. Jed said he would rather be a woodcutter. Paul said, hogwash. You will not be a woodcutter, and that is final. Paul went into his room and slammed his door. Then Jed went into his room and slammed his door. Jane Ellen and I just sat in the parlor and stared gloomily at the torn, at the torn wallpaper. November 18, 1864, Paul took up the job as a woodcutter. He will chop firewood for the shops on Pennsylvania Avenue. Paul is not very hardy looking, but his arms are quite strong from playing the violin. November 21st, 1864. Jed says that General Sherman's army is still in Georgia. The newspaper has sent most of its reporters to the South to cover the story. I know Jed aches to go with them, but for once I am glad that he only sets type. I dread his ever being captured again, as he was during the Battle of Gettysburg. He still has a bad limp from his wound, and he still carries dark memories that time does not seem to erase. This darkness causes Jed to worry a lot. Ever since the election, he has been worried about President Lincoln's safety. He has been brooding lately about the souvenir seekers who swarmed the White House after the president won. They store tassels from window curtains, they snipped pieces from the wallpaper and chair covers. November 23, 1864, at dinner, Jed said that President Lincoln has declared the last Thursday of every November as a national day of Thanksgiving. On this day, every year, we Americans will, get, will stop work and thank God for our blessings. And we still celebrate Thanksgiving now. So that was when it first started in 1864. That's kind of interesting. Tomorrow, we will read a little bit more and I'll talk about the Thursday part of the packet.